The following podcast is a deep, shallow dive production. And you're going to love it. Okay, let's go. Hey, what's up, everybody? Hope everybody is well. All right, so today I am going to add a new kind of kind of segment or a new way of doing things on the podcast. And I, I think this will be great. I finally found a, a piece of software to download, basically downloading stuff off of YouTube so I can use the audio file and then, and then being able to kind of interject my thoughts on, on what the audio file says, because there are some, you know, there's some amazing long form content on G- YouTube. You know, it's pretty interesting when it comes to how people really, how I see people consuming content these days, it's kind of, you know, two distinct buckets. One is, you know, short form content. And when I say short form content, I'm talking about, you know, 60 second reels, 90 second reels, YouTube shorts, maybe, although YouTube shorts, I don't think get that much play. Pretty much everything you see on Instagram, in your stories, and then in the reels, and then on TikTok, if you use TikTok, and then on Facebook, if you use Facebook in terms of the reels. So that's the short form stuff. And then long form, Obviously, YouTube is the home for that, and that's where you've got the in-depth interviews that last an hour, two hours, things like that. So I do watch a decent amount of those, and this is actually really cool. I'm going to be able to like pull those now and and share that stuff with you guys and, and obviously interject my comments throughout. So that's what we're going to do today, and we're going to do it with something I've been wanting to do for a while, and that is... A talk about the Russia Ukraine stuff. And by the way, the reason I want to talk about Russia Ukraine and then, you know, Gaza, Palestine, Israel, you know, China, Taiwan, Venezuela, you know, the things I mentioned in yesterday's podcast, and then talk about, you know, 9 11, talk about JFK assassination, talk about what's the other big one as of late? Oh, all that stuff. And the reason is because I really do think that geopolitics fundamentally and all the, the, the theories, I'm just going to call them theories, that have taken place on all the controversial things in the past, they're all related. They really are. And fundamentally, when you, when you truly think about what happens in the world and why things happen, they happen because some entity wants to, you know, change the script a little, rewrite the rules a little, re, re, reshuffle the map a little, you know, get more control, get more power, get more influence, all of that stuff. And I really do think they're all related. And so right now, obviously since 2022, and the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, which obviously got painted in a certain light in the media, in the mainstream media at least, I think that that's important because that stuff does funnel into, you know, the military industrial complex talk that we've had a lot, you know, the the concept of these forever wars, you know, the funneling of money to, you know, all these entities that that then work its way around the system. And like I said, I think people are are a little bit waking up to a lot of this. And even if they're not waking up, they're asking questions and they want to understand how things work and why things work. And so, you know, I think it's actually good to understand these big things that are going on in the world. All right, so today let's let's focus on, we're going to focus on Russia, Ukraine, and we're going to do this through an interview that Professor Jeffrey Sachs, I really like this guy. He is a world-renowned, you know, geopolitical scientist that, he's American, by the way, but he's just a really insightful guy, and he does an amazing job at delivering the message in a, in a dumbed-down fashion that's easy to understand. So he went on Pierce Morgan's Uncensored. And by the way, you know, Pierce Morgan takes a lot of grief in a lot of different situations, but I honestly like the guy. I really do. I think he, you know, for the most part, I don't agree with everything 
he says or talks about, but I do like him because I think he tackles tough topics. And I think that he really like, you know, absolutely, you know, gives people the ability and the platform and he gives people the chance to, to make their arguments. He really does. And so I applaud that. So this is Jeffrey Sachs on Pierce Morgan. I'm going to play the interview and then interject things throughout. So let's start with really, you know, this beginning piece is fundamentally, this is the crux of what the issue, the two issues were for, for Putin in terms of Ukraine. Well, there are two issues. Uh, one is no NATO enlargement. And the second is uh, this uh, territorial issue. It involves Crimea and uh, what they claim is uh, four regions of Russia. All right. Remember, NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and that was created back during the Cold War in order to basically in order to combat a, a growing and potentially violent Russia. But then remember, Russia got completely dismantled during the Reagan administration. And so really, fundamentally, there should NATO should have gotten dismantled. You know, there was no need for NATO when there's no more Russia, but it didn't. And it got bigger and it got stronger. To my mind, this is overwhelmingly about the first issue is about NATO, because that's been the issue on the table for 30 years. Territory was not on the table until two years ago, but for 30 years, NATO was on the table. I think the territorial issues, if I may say, uh, are probably negotiable, at least in part. Of course, there's been a war going on for uh, 10 years now and an escalation during the last two years. All right. So again, remember, the war he's talking about there is Crimea. And Crimea is, you know, a section of really Russia, Ukraine that the Russians took back. And I think that was in 2014. It was definitely during the Obama administration because Obama was criticized for for letting Putin do that. But again, we're not going to get too much into that. But what I will say is from everything that I've read about that, the people in Crimea absolutely identified as Russians. So it's like they, they wanted to be back in the fold with Russia. Really quick, I just looked this up. It said 60% of the people that were in Crimea identified as Russian at the time. And this was 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea technically back from Ukraine. So 60% of the population identified as Russian at that time. I think the non-negotiable parts of what Putin is saying, I would guess really non-negotiable, so we have to think about them, is that NATO will not enlarge to Ukraine. And I think Crimea is non-negotiable for uh, Russia's uh, core security uh, interests and perceptions and uh, history. So I think what's really absolutely core to what President Putin is saying is he would like to stop the war. He doesn't want to take over Ukraine. He doesn't want to take more of Ukraine. Uh, on the combat line right now, on the contact line, he doesn't control uh, all four of these provinces. And I doubt uh, that he would insist on that. I do think that he would uh, uh, hold out for Crimea almost every Western analyst and expert agrees with that, and there are many reasons for that. But what I do think is at the core of this all along was Russia throughout its history has always believed in keeping some safety from the West, which has repeatedly invaded uh, Russia. And after the end of the Soviet Union in 1991, the U.S. and Germany had said to Gorbachev and to Yeltsin, we won't expand NATO one inch eastward. All right. So, again, I'm going to try to keep this super top line so it's it's deep and shallow at the same time. But remember, when NATO 
was created in like 1949 or something. It was again created to combat a a a violent Soviet Union or or an aggressive Soviet Union, okay? And then the Soviet Union created the Warsaw Pact, which was like their version of NATO with several like Eastern European socialist countries to basically say, okay, that's fine. We're going to create the Warsaw Pact. It's going to be us, East Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, you know, these Eastern European countries. And then again, when NATO, I'm sorry, when the Soviet Union was disbanded in 91, the Warsaw Pact came to an end, okay? And then I think it was Boris Yeltsin who was in charge of the Soviet Union then. But basically they're like, okay, hey, we're going to get rid of the Warsaw Pact and you guys get rid of NATO. <laughs> but but they did not get rid of NATO. They basically were like, yeah, we're just going to keep NATO. And by the way, we're probably going to make it stronger. And this is when all this stuff started. This is when all these, you know, almost almost like a it, it it was a flex. I mean, it was a flex. They were like the U S and, and the Western European countries are like, you know what? Screw it. Let's keep, let's keep NATO because you know, who knows? I don't know. Maybe they were like, Hey, we don't trust the Russians. We don't want to ever let them get strong again. And I think fundamentally that's where, you know, this secondary battle started. But then, uh, like always with the United States, they, they lied, they cheated, and they started the expansion. And then uh, the Russians, I was uh, observing this all along, the first expansions, which were in Central Europe, didn't come too close to Russia. All right. So again, really quick, you know, so basically after, after Soviet Union disbanded, Warsaw Pact's gone, you know, now, instead of, again, NATO being gone, NATO started to get stronger and they started to basically pick off countries that previously might have even been aligned with the Soviet Union, but they started adding them to NATO. And again, all these countries, for the most part, bordered the Soviet Union. But again, nothing borders the Soviet Union or Russia as much as Ukraine does. And they said, Ugh, we don't like that. You cheated. You told us no. Uh, but OK, that's Hungary, Poland and Czech Republic. That was 1999 under Clinton. But then it just kept coming and kept coming and kept coming. And they said with rising decibels uh, and uh, r rising fervor, stop coming closer. All right. So, again, Cold War's over and then all of a sudden in, I think, yeah, 1999, Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic. So like eight years later, those guys now join NATO. And their ultimate red line has been consistent. It is Ukraine and Georgia. Why? Well, it, it goes back, peers to uh, the British Empire, <laughs> to uh, 1853 to 1856, actually to Lord Palmerston. He had an idea, surround Russia in the Black Sea, uh, render Russia's fleet in the Black Sea in Sevastopol, which was there in 1853, just like it's uh, there in 2024, uh, render it essentially inoperable, uh, control the Dardanelles. This is a long story. Uh, and uh, then Russia is a second or third rate power. This seriously reminds me of Game of Thrones. If you watched Game of Thrones and like, I think it was called the Black Fleet or the Black something. Hold on. Let me look it up. All right. It was called the Iron Fleet. <laughs> it was the Greyjoy families. That's funny. I might have to go back and watch that and see if I can find any parallels. And President Putin is responding to what has been uh, a, a British uh, imperial attempt for uh, 175 years and a U.S. attempt since 1991. All right, I will tell you that little country of England is a is a freaking menace, man. They really are the the British royalty monarchy. That country's a menace. 
they've caused a lot of problems over the years. I'll, I'll have to try and do a recap episode of all the all the things they got involved in. And then basically, I think after World War II is when they passed the torch and the United States became the dominant player. And then England became like number two. Uh, basically to surround Russia with NATO. And what Putin has been saying is don't do that. Stop. Leave Ukraine as a, uh, a kind of buffer zone. Uh, and Ukraine was perfectly happy with that. And public opinion was perfectly happy with that. And they didn't want to join NATO. All right. So that's kind of the end of big section number one. Just remember to recap that in a, in a deep, shallow mentality. When the Soviet Union was disbanded in 1990 or 91, you know, the Warsaw Pact was disbanded. NATO was not disbanded. And then basically, it was almost like business as usual for the United States and the Western countries. And they, they pretty much kind of always wanted to, wanted to keep Russia in check. And I think the big red line for, you know, Russia, and then really this is where Putin kind of got in the mix, was he said, okay, that's fine, you know, whatever, we want to we wanna be nice, but you guys aren't going to let us, you guys aren't going to be nice to us, but just stay away from Ukraine. That is our red line. All right, now we're moving into the next seriously big topic in terms of Ukraine, and that is this Viktor Yanukovych guy. And in 2009, they elected Viktor Yanukovych, who promised them neutrality. All right. So Viktor Yanukovych was democratically elected in 2009. And again, his entire position was, hey, you know what? We don't want to join NATO. We don't want to join Russia. We want to be Switzerland. We want to be on our own in the middle. Just leave us alone. Don't bug us and don't try to get us to be on your side. We just want to be happy as being a neutral player in the middle. Okay which was the promise that Ukraine itself had made in declaring its independence, that they would be permanently a neutral country because they're in between West and East. They're in between Europe and Western Europe or European Union and Russia. So they wanted just, okay, we'll be, we'll be neutral. But then the United States did team up to overthrow Yanukovych in February 2014, and that's when this war started. All right, so this is seriously super important. Now, I'll have to go back and try to see what things were like between 2009 when he got elected and then 2014, but just just know this is all seriously exactly how it happened. In 2014, I think this was maybe coinciding with the Crimea stuff, but basically, Yanukovych gets overthrown and regime change happens. Uh, that's when Russia uh, stops saying, well, we'll lease a base in Crimea. Rather, we'll take back Crimea. We don't want it to fall into NATO hands. Uh, so this is basically a long, long story. I think the rest is negotiable. Uh, I basically think either the U.S. and Europe don't understand what they're doing, which is not impossible, uh, or they're still on what has been a 30-year neocon agenda, which I know about in detail, which is get NATO all the way to surround Russia, because that was the plan of Zbigniew Brzezinski and Dick Cheney and others going right back to the 1990s. They still want to do it, and they think they can still accomplish this. Okay. All right, before I let Pierce jump in, I think that's exactly what this all is. I really do. I think that neoconservative, they call it the neocons, this was, you know, George H. It started with, God, it may have even started with Reagan, but I don't really think Reagan. I think it was George H. Bush, Papa Bush, and then moved on to his son, uh, George W., but then Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, Paul Wolfowitz, all these guys that are considered the neoconservatives. And I promise next week I'm going to do an episode on these guys because I think it's ridiculously important because they're still in the mix. I mean, just last week, Dick Cheney 
came out and endorsed Kamala Harris. And again, all of this stuff is by design. These neoconservatives have partnered with now the neoliberals, and this is what this ruling class uniparty looks like. Seriously. And the reason I know that is because what's hilarious to me is for 30, 20, yeah, 30 years, Democrats have been disgusted by Dick Cheney. Like they have, they have called Dick Cheney the devil himself. Right. And then last week when he comes out and endorses Kamala, they're like, bragging about it seriously think about that that's that no, nobody's really pieced that together like that i don't think i haven't heard but seriously think about that here's somebody along with george w bush who literally has been the arch enemy of democrats for 30 years now and now all of a sudden because they don't support trump and they've gone away from the MAGA side of Republicans, and now they're outwardly supporting Democrats. That's fine. That's their prerogative. But I think it's hilarious that the Democrats rejoice in that because to me, it's like, dude, what are you talking about? We, we hate this guy. Okay. That's fine. He, he supports us, but let's not, let's not brag about that. I come back to my initial question, which is ultimately yeah. All right, so Pierce Morgan's about to jump in more. And again, it's interesting to hear his side, which is a little bit, I guess, the other side. But this is worth listening to. You know, I, I'm, listen, you've been through a lot of the history there, and some of the points are arguable, but a lot of people uh, I've heard express similar sentiments about some of the background to this and about Russia's concern about the encroachment of NATO and so on. But it, it doesn't change the fact that Russia illegally invaded a European sovereign democratic country, that it's helped itself to vast swathes of the land, and that latest polls show that the vast majority of Ukrainian people do not want to cede an inch of the land that's been taken to Vladimir Putin or the Russians. And yeah, he can say, I was concerned about NATO encroachment, but NATO hadn't actually encroached. So he is preemptively doing this and if ultimately he's allowed to take this land, what message does that send the rest of the world, the rest of Europe, the other neighboring countries to Ukraine? Why should we have any confidence after Crimea, after Georgia, after Ukraine now, that he wouldn't just carry on attacking and invading other neighboring countries? That's where I find your, I wouldn't say trust, I don't think that's the right word, but you seem very reliant on accepting Putin's worldview rather than perhaps the stark reality of the barbarism with which he's executed this war. All right. So there's a lot of fair sentiment in that. You know, he's basically saying, okay, with all that being said, still, he's the one that invaded in 2022. Now, again, you know, I'm curious to see what Jeffrey Sachs says about that. And like, it's almost like, did it get to a point where he sort of had no choice or again, did did he did he invade without necessarily needing to invade out of the fear and really it is fear based that Ukraine is going to join NATO? Yeah, may, maybe because I know too much about the United States because the first war in Europe after World War II was the U.S. bombing of Belgrade for seventy eight days to change borders of a European state. The idea was to break Serbia, to create uh, Kosovo as an enclave, and then to install Bondesteel, which is the largest NATO base in the Balkans, in the Southwest Balkans. All right, that's another deep, shallow dive that needs to happen. The whole concept of... Why did the United States, after World War II, bomb Belgrade, and why did they basically want to split the country of Serbia into two countries and create Kosovo in order to then have a military base on Kosovo. You know, it's funny. I mean, God, I hear the name Kosovo. I hear the country name Kosovo and even Serbia. Serbia, I know a little bit better because, because uh, what's his face? Uh, Djokovic, the tennis player. Oh my God, why am I blanking on his first name? 
Jesus, Novak Djokovic. He's the tennis player, number one ranked for many, many years from Serbia. So I know Serbia more, I know about Serbia, I guess a little more than I do about Kosovo, but I will dig into that one because that's interesting. So the U.S. started this under Clinton uh, that uh, we will break the borders. We will illegally bomb another country. We didn't have any U.N. authority. This was a, quote, NATO mission to do that. Then I know the United States uh, went to war repeatedly, illegally, uh, in uh, what it uh, did in Afghanistan and then what it did in Iraq. All right. So for those of you that have been loyal listeners, seriously, I, I hope some of this stuff makes you be like, holy shit, we've talked about that. We've talked about that. We've talked about that. And again, man, this stuff all... I don't want to say they're all related because I'm not saying they're they're related in in that regard, but they're related in the regard that there's fuckery in this world. And again, this is this is just all about calling a spade a spade and and really just being like, okay, holy mackerel, wow, they did it here, this happened there. And again, not just they, everyone. I'm talking about everyone. But I like I like when these, you know, we've talked a lot about Afghanistan and Iraq and all that. And that's interesting that it comes up here as, you know, another example after he already shared, you know, something we haven't talked about, which is Serbia, Kosovo. Uh, And then what it did in Syria, which was uh, the Obama administration, especially Obama and Hillary Clinton, tasking the CIA to overthrow Bashar al-Assad. God damn, this episode's like creating more work for me. All right, there's another one, Syria and the whole thing that happened with Bashar al-Assad, and I know there's a lot of crazy stuff with that dude. I will dig into that cuz honestly, I don't I don't really know anything about that. Uh, and then what it did with NATO illegally bombing Libya to topple Muammar Gaddafi. This is like the 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 gift that keeps on giving. This episode more deep shallow dives coming from it. But the Libya Gaddafi thing, that one, that one, I am really going to do a big time episode on that one because that one is super interesting. And again, that's a guy that, you know, in my mind, I always thought was so negative. But now that I've been researching him, I think you're going to be incredibly surprised with with what you learn about him. Uh, And then what it did in Kiev in February 2014. I happened to see some of that with my own eyes. All right. So basically now he's back to Kiev, February 2014. And again, this is when Viktor Yanukovych was overthrown. So this is another like, like big, big topic number two about Ukraine that if you don't understand this, you can't understand the invasion from 2022. So listen to this on Viktor Yanukovych. The U.S. overthrew Yanukovych together with right-wing Ukrainian military forces. We overthrew a president. And what's interesting, by the way, is we overthrew Yanukovych the day after the European Union representatives had reached an agreement with Yanukovych to have early elections, a government of national unity, and a stand-down of both sides. That was agreed. The next thing that happens is the opposition, quote unquote, says we don't agree. They stormed the government buildings and they deposed Yanukovych. All right, this is pretty wild because that all of a sudden reminded me of what's going on in Venezuela right now with this Maduro guy. Same thing happened. He wins the election and then within hours, the opposition backed by us is like, no, no, you guys cheated, you guys cheated. And again, remember how much I've talked about the oil reserves of Venezuela. They have the most oil reserves in the world. That's the richest country in the world when it comes to oil. But let's get back to Yanukovych. And within hours, the United States says, yes, we support the new government. It didn't say, oh, we had an agreement. That's unconstitutional what you did. Uh, So we overthrew a government. Contrary to a promise that the European Union had made, and by the way, uh, Russia, the United States, and the EU were parties to that agreement, 
and the United States an hour afterwards backed the coup. Okay, so everyone's got a little bit to answer for. And by the way, I did, I did, I don't even want to call it fact checking because I would never insult Professor Jeffrey Sachs by fact checking him. But I did check on all this stuff just through chat GPT and then also through Google. And it went down exactly like he said. So that was 2014. In 2015, the uh, Russians did not say, we want the Donbass back. They said peace should come through negotiations and negotiations between the ethnic Russians in the east of Ukraine and this uh, new regime in Kiev led to the Minsk II agreement. The Minsk II agreement was voted by the UN Security Council unanimously. It was signed by the government of Ukraine. It was guaranteed explicitly by Germany and France. And you know what? And it's been explained to me in person. It was laughed at inside the US government. This is after the UN Security Council unanimously accepted it. The Ukrainians said, we don't want to give autonomy to the region. Oh, but that's part of the treaty. The US told them, don't worry about it. Angela Merkel explained in De Zeit, uh, in a notorious interview uh, after uh, the 2022 escalation, she said, oh, you know, we knew that Minsk II was just a, a, a holding pattern to give Ukraine time to build its strength. So just really quick. So this Minsk II, again, was signed by Ukraine, Russia, France and Germany, collectively known as the Normandy Four. And it was basically a ceasefire. It was like, OK, hey, let's calm it down. And this is in that Donbass region of Ukraine, which, you know, we've heard about through Vivek and then Nikki Haley, who has no idea where that was. Uh, Minsk II was a U.N. Security Council unanimously adopted treaty that was supposed to end the war. So when it comes to who's trustworthy, who to believe and so forth, I guess my problem, Piers, is I know the United States government. Uh, I know it very well. Uh, I don't trust them for a moment. I want these two sides actually to sit down in front of the whole world and say, these are the terms. Then the world can judge because we could get on paper clearly for both sides of the world. We're not going to overthrow governments anymore. The United States needs to say we accept this agreement. The United States needs to say Russia needs to say we're not stepping one foot farther than whatever the boundary is actually reached. And NATO's not going to enlarge. And let's put it for the whole world to see. All right, you know what's interesting in that? And this is where I really do think history repeats itself is, you know, everything that, that he just talked about, you could say the same thing about right now, Gaza, Palestine, Israel. And, you know, you put Netanyahu, I don't really know if Netanyahu's the role of Putin. He's not because the U.S. is on Netanyahu's side. But a lot of that stuff that you just listened to, to me, makes sense in this current situation as well. Meaning, hey, there's enough to go around for everybody. And let's just use diplomacy to figure this thing out. I mean, I don't know. It, it, it really, I really do see like parallels in this stuff. Uh, and, and my fear with Putin is I don't trust him as far as I can throw him. I take your point about Russia, about American uh, military activity. I was the editor of the Daily Mirror newspaper in England, which led the campaign against the Iraq war, which I thought was a senseless, illegal uh, invasion Thank as you. well. And I, I've been very critical of <laughs> America. You. Yeah, so, look, you know, I'm, it's not like I'm a great uh, cheerleader for, for what America's done on the military stage, but purely looking at this situation with Ukraine... I just, I just don't see why yeah, Pierre, allowing Pierre, Putin I, to keep I, all this land you. is a good thing. All right, so I cut out a bunch of stuff because, man, it was just too in the weeds. But this is interesting. So listen to this. And again, remember, so, so at this point, you know, the main thing that I think hopefully is clear is that, you know, Ukraine is a huge border on the west side of Russia. So on the west side of Russia. So like if you're looking at your hand, if you're staring at your left hand right now, basically your thumb 
is Ukraine, and then the four fingers in your palm is Russia. So Russia doesn't want Ukraine, the thumb, which is attached to like, I don't know, 600 miles of their border, maybe even way more than that. They don't want that going into NATO. And so listen to this. This is a good analogy and another deep, shallow dive. Man, this episode's the gift that keeps giving. When the Soviet Union came close to the United States uh, in Cuba, the U.S. said, Monroe Doctrine, you don't come anywhere close to our hemisphere. We nearly had nuclear Armageddon in 1962. So this was the whole Cuban Missile Crisis with John F. Kennedy. And again, I will deep shallow dive that. The Soviet Union was doing nothing different from what the United States was doing in Turkey. It was placing nuclear offensive missiles or weapons near the border of the adversary. Uh, actually, Khrushchev said, I don't want war with them. I just want to do what they're doing to us. It nearly led to nuclear annihilation. It's good for superpowers to keep a little distance. The United States is expansionist. If you say the Russians are expansionist or the Soviet Union is expansionist, keep a little space between them. And that's what President Putin has been saying for more than two decades. Keep a little space, be prudent. We don't want the United States right up against our border. And the U.S. has really provoked it, not only overthrowing a Ukrainian president, bad judgment in my opinion. All right. So again, I mean, that summarizes really, you know, what I think the fundamental thing is, and that is, again, taking over or adding Ukraine to NATO so that so that there is aggression along their border. But then listen to this stuff. Here's more. Man, I don't know if I'll DSD these, but these are worth listening to. But also unilaterally walking out of the anti-ballistic missile treaty in 2002, unilaterally placing Aegis missiles in Poland and Romania and when Russia say, what are you doing? You're breaking the whole security architecture. The U.S. says, and I quote, it's none of your business what we do. NATO's none of your business, Russia. That's the formal, literal position of the United States of America, that we can go anywhere with any third country, including Ukraine or Georgia. We can put our missiles wherever we want. It's none of your business, Russia. Well, come on, Piers, this is going to get us all blown up if we don't have a little bit more common sense. All right, I like this next part that Pierce Morgan chimes in. So let's listen to this. Yeah, yeah and I've talked to you a couple of times. I find you fascinating to talk to you, by the way. And, and I, you know, I know you have a, a deep knowledge of all this, albeit you have some interpretation of, of what's gone on that's different to, to what I have. But I respect your knowledge um, and your scholarship on this. But I'm just struck that your language towards Russia and Putin is nowhere near as censorious as it is about uh, America. About your own country. It's true. And I, but I, but I think that you know what? I sit here in England and think, it's so weird to see such a learned American professor who seems to think that, a Rush, that, that America is the real problem here, not Vladimir Putin and Russia, when many other people yeah, you would know think the, the complete is, opposite. Piers, the problem is uh, I, <laughs> I was born in 1954, and I've seen nothing but U.S. wars of choice and CIA ops my whole life. And since I became an international development specialist more than 40 years ago, I've seen many of them up close. And I'm tired of them. You know, a, a very good book written in uh, 2017 by a professor at Boston College named Lindsay O'Rourke has the title Covert Regime Change. She studies peers no fewer than 64 covert regime change operations by the United States, almost all of them CIA led. 64 during the period 1947 to 1989. I've had heads of state say to me personally, peers, they're going to, they're going to take me out was the term that one of them used. And I assured them, 
this president uh, in, uh, it was a Haiti, Haitian president. They're, no, 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 we're gonna get all this sorted out in my naive way. They walked this president, this was Aristide, out to an unmarked plane, flew him 23 hours in this coup that the US arranged to Central African Republic and in a broad daylight launched a coup and when I tried to get the New York Times to at least cover the story, I wanted to read, <laughs> read about it, I was told by the reporter on the beat, oh, our editors aren't interested in that. So you can have coups in broad daylight. You can also have assassinations of presidents in broad daylight. Shuck it, ducky. All right, so I cut out some more that, again, I just, I don't want this stuff to be in the weeds, but all right, let's listen to kind of like his bottom line. But the reason is for Russia, Ukraine is their 2,100 kilometer border, and they view this as an existential issue. I can tell you for the U.S., this is a game. This is the game of risk, if you know that board game. This is Zbig Brzezinski's game spelled out in 1997 in his article in Foreign Affairs called A Strategy for Eurasia, Let's Corner Russia. This is their game. For Russia, this is existential. This is right on their border. They don't want the United States right on yeah, their border. Yeah, but again, border. again, so sorry to jump to in, but end. again, again, this is your interpretation of that. But the other interpretation That's can correct. be, the other interpretation is that to stop Russia invading its neighboring countries, that's what NATO's about. And it's proven very successful. Well, with all, those, put, all those countries that attacked before haven't been attacked since because they're part of NATO. So th this is this is the, it, it could be Pierce. It's, it's the other argument. It could other, be, but yeah, it. No, you're right. You're right. But then it could be nuclear war. That's all I'm saying. But why would why and, would and, Vladimir, uh, okay? Well, why would Vladimir Putin, who is apparently Elon Musk says he's the richest man on earth and loves his material things, whether it's chateaus or super yachts or whatever it may be. Why would somebody with that mentality, in other words, not an Islamic fundamentalist who has nothing, who wants to kill himself for the cause and believes he's going to you know, meet 70 virgins up in, in, uh, in wherever they end up going, um, why is somebody with Putin's materialistic, capitalistic mentality, why would he even contemplate Armageddon and losing everything? That's, that's not what he's about. He hasn't got that mentality. He's not someone... He's not a suicide bomber, I, yeah, is he? I, yeah. I do totally agree with Pierce on that. I think all these guys, honestly, I think, I think un unfortunately, and maybe to an extent fortunately, but any country that has nuclear weapons, it's almost like the equalizer, like with everyone else. And, and that includes the United States, Russia, all these countries that have nuclear weapons. It's kind of like you can only bully people so far if they have a nuclear weapon. If they don't have a nuclear weapon, then you can bully them as far as you want. Well, I, I think it, it's useful for all of us uh, and you and uh, everybody listening to go online uh, and read a, a memorandum by one of our best diplomats, William Burns, who happens now to be CIA director. But in 2008, was the U.S. ambassador to Russia. And he wrote a secret memo uh, back to Condoleezza Rice, Secretary of State. Uh, Julian Assange enabled all of us to see the real discussion, not the superficial patter and narrative. And he explained, this isn't about Putin, this question of NATO. This is the entire Russian political class, everybody. And the, the, the memo famously is called Niet means Niet. That for Russia, this isn't Putin, this isn't one person, this isn't a lark. This is viewed by Russia as existential. This is viewed by Russia as do not stand on our borders, period. Especially now that the United States has abandoned unilaterally the anti-ballistic missile treaty. It has abandoned the international nuclear force. It's not Putin, it's Russia. And by the way, you would feel the same way in their position. And the United States absolutely 
felt the same way when that was tested. And we have this doctrine, by the way, which is uh, even more uh, <laughs> remarkable. Since 1823, we've said no foreign powers in the entire Western Hemisphere, not just on our border, but the entire Western Hemisphere. And that doctrine, that Monroe Doctrine, was reiterated. I was sitting there when Donald Trump reiterated that in the UN General Assembly. That was for the whole Western Hemisphere. So it's perfectly understandable, and it's not about Putin. This is, it's about Russia's absolute core national security don't come up to our border. Perfectly sensible. Professor Sachs, great to talk to you again. I, I find our conversations fascinating. Wonderful to be with you. I really, really enjoy it. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks to Professor Sachs and thank you, Pierce Morgan, for letting me use your interview. Anyway, I, I, I don't know. I, I hope that was interesting. I mean, I found it personally very interesting. And again, you know, the, the biggest part of all of that, and there's another interview that ironically Pierce did with John Mearsheimer, who's another guy I really like, and I'll, I'll do that one coming up as well. You know, again, this is all just to balance out the, I guess the narrative around, okay, what is going on between Russia and Ukraine? We've spent $250 billion. Imagine that. Imagine if that $250 billion since 2022 had gone back into America. I mean, talk about, <laughs> you're going to laugh, making America great again. I mean, that's... That's what we should be doing. That money should be put back into America, not, go, not going into that war in Ukraine. And then Europe put $150 billion in. Again, those are Trump's numbers from the other day, but I have to imagine they're, they're relatively close if he's saying them. And it's not, I will say this, when he came out with those numbers, I thought, oh my God, the media is going to crucify this. They're going to say he's making it up. He's but he's, but they didn't, there wasn't any quote unquote debunking of those numbers. So anyway, again, at the end of the day, I, I mean, they're, they're all, they're all to blame in, in, in some parts for sure. And including Putin, including, I don't, I don't think any of these people are quote unquote good people. I really don't, but all I really personally find interesting is just hearing the entire story. And then from there, kind of, you know, I don't want to say assigning blame, but at least you have a slightly better understanding about kind of what the situation is. All right, that's it, everybody. I hope that was enjoyable. Have a wonderful weekend. Call a spade a spade, and we will talk to you soon. This guy was good. This episode was brought to you by the new book, Deep Shallow Dive Into You, available now on Amazon and Barnes & Noble in hardcover and paperback. Don't forget to sign up for our new mailing list on our website at deepshallowdive.com.